Hello friends, welcome to the ATC Double Cut. I have Jim Huntoon joining the show today. And we're gonna talk about my recent visit to Myrtle Beach and to Ori Georgetown Technical College. Welcome to the show, Jim. Dr. Woods, thank you so much. Glad to be here. You are a, a second time guest on the show. I believe uh, you were on a couple years ago when we talked about frost delays which is a fun topic. And uh, at that time, you were a golf course superintendent, weren't you? Yes, I was at Heritage Club in Pauley's Island, South Carolina. And in the subsequent time, you have now moved on to a new role as an associate professor of golf and sports turf management at Ori Georgetown Technical College. Um, can you tell me a little bit how that transition has gone? very well. It's been a very enjoyable career move for me. I, I, I thought it would be, Micah, when I entertained the idea of doing it. And now that I'm a three semesters in, um, it's very rewarding. It's been a, a great opportunity for me. And um, it is something that is challenging that I'm slowly but surely getting better at. <laughs> So hopefully that trend continues. Well, I was impressed when I had the chance to visit on April, April 3rd, when we had the Palmetto GCSA education meeting um, together with a lot of students from Ori Georgetown Technical College. And I was so impressed with, uh, with the professionalism of the students. And so many people introduced themselves to me uh, before the talk and they asked questions and then after the talk they asked follow-up questions and said thank you and I was like wow uh, there's some good kind of training going on or people are just extremely polite naturally but I think maybe it's a combination of both uh, is that something that you've focused on just in addition to the uh, turf grass education and and all of that but just how to to uh, handle themselves at meetings like that it is, and you know, you use you use the word training, and and that's part of what we do here. We we educate, obviously, and but we also train in a lot of different ways. And and yes, yeah, soft skill, professionalism um, are all key points. In addition to learning about turf grass and and turf grass management, we we do stress that, and and I think it's important for the uh, students. Because, it, you know, statistically, Micah, many of them may not end up in turf grass management. When I look back at the 50 students that I graduated here with, uh, there's probably 10 to 15 at most that are still in the business. So, but those kind of professionalism and soft skills um, translate to any path one takes. So I think they're important and uh, it's certainly something that others are doing i don't think it's unique but uh we do do it professor granger and i are very big on it we've had some help here at the college we've got a great career services department that comes in and gives presentations to the students about how to act professionally and um it kind of came together and uh i'm proud of that and i'm proud of them for um for stepping up and you know micah you're a person that you know i use a lot of your um material in class so they know you and certainly uh, you're one of many people that I use to help me educate. I look at myself as a conduit for information mostly. Well, um, I was glad to make that visit to Myrtle Beach. I had never been before and I knew it's a golfing hotspot and you'd invited me to uh, do a Zoom lecture or, or you know, join the class remotely. And with the time change from my usual location in Thailand or in Japan, um, we just weren't able to ever get that scheduled. And then it turned out that in advance of the masters, uh, there was the education meeting and I was able to actually make an in-person visit to Myrtle Beach for the very first time. And can, I will bring up the blog post that we'll give the double cut treatment to now. And, uh, I want to talk about 
uh, something that surprised me. Uh, I would say the, the thing that surprised me the most was I did not realize in Myrtle Beach that so many courses overseed with perennial ryegrass. I, I had thought that in the American Southeast, most places would, that have, you know, they have warm season grass, typically Bermuda grass, tees, fairways, and rough. And I thought that the tees and fairways would have gotten painted. And I, the first course, you took me around to visit some courses and I saw ryegrass and then the next course, ryegrass. And this was in early April. The greens weren't overseeded, but the tees, fairways, and roughs were. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the number of courses, you know, the, the, the size of the golf market there, or maybe it's called the Grand Strand. You can correct me with the terminology and, and tell me about overseeding there and perhaps why I, I shouldn't be surprised about that. So the Grand Strand area is straddles. It's mostly in South Carolina, but there is part of it that straddles the North Carolina line. Um, it's about a 60 mile stretch of, of uninterrupted beach um, that we call the Grand Strand. It's a geographical name, but we have about 80 golf courses in that area. Uh, I'm gonna say 65 to 70 of them routinely overseed mica. Um, mostly tees fairways. Um, there are some greens that get overseeded as well with Poa Trivialis on the Ultra Vorse. And then we do have some courses that uh, overseed wall to wall. In fact, that's gained a little bit more popularity in the last two or three years since golf has kind of gone through this growth of, of um, after the, the pandemic. But uh, yeah, we have a few courses with bent grass greens as well here. Um, I guess you would consider this the very southern end of the transition zone. Uh, but uh, with our resort market, um, we've always overseeded here. So that's not really ever changed. Um, a lot of the ownership groups of the different courses um, feel that their clientele wants to come down here and play on overseeded grass. So that's what the market has stuck with. That, that is something that I was so glad to learn. Um, I, I often think of uh, Augusta National Golf Club as being a bit of an outlier in the Southeast in overseeding wall to wall. And, and, you know, when everybody watches the Masters Tournament, they're looking at bent grass putting greens, but the rest of the course is a Bermuda grass base with a, a nice perennial ryegrass overseed on it. And then I think of other overseeding hot spots as the Palm Springs area, the Coachella Valley in Southern California, and the Phoenix area. Um, I, I think of those as overseeding areas, and I didn't realize that Myrtle Beach was one too. So I was so curious, and if you remember, I asked you, uh, when do people typically put the seed down? Because that's, that's something that's been a curiosity of mine for a while. And, and I forget exactly what you answered, but uh, I think if, if I remember right, it was something like September into early November or something like that. Can you, let me ask you that question again. In Myrtle Beach on those uh, 65 or 70 courses that do overseed, what's the timing look like on that? What are, what are people doing? I'm going to say October 1 to December 1 is the window. And uh, that's changed a little bit over the years back 20 years ago, I'd say mid-September um, was more common overseeding time than, than the later end of that. When more people had bent grass greens, um, they would try to coincide aeration events, core aeration events with overseeding. Um, so they would go a little bit earlier. Um, I could tell you some stories about um, courses in this area having to spray fairways <laughs> and rough with sub max for Pythium control, Micah, but that's a that's a long story, but uh, no, it's changed. It's October 1 to, like I said, December 1. Um, overseeding here is done much differently than those other areas you mentioned, different than Augusta and other areas in the southeast that overseed for tournament preparation and certainly much different than the desert southwest. So if you want to 
get into some of those intricacies, we certainly can. Um, but uh, uh, there's a lot to talk about with this. So I'll just open it back up to you. Good. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if I don't remember to come back and ask you about overseeding without closing the course, um, which, which I want to talk about, um, please, please bring that up. Uh, I'll make a little note overseeding without closing. Um, I got a chance to do that when I was in Japan, so maybe we could discuss uh, that. But let, let's work through this timing, this blog post that I'm giving the double cut treatment to, which will be, uh, I think, of interest to many people. Uh, even if you don't overseed, it's kind of interesting as a, as a scientific, uh, technical turf grass uh, calculation type of thing. So let's, let's work through that. We'll see what uh, I predicted after my curiosity about when it might be a good time to overseed in Myrtle Beach. I, I looked up the weather data and calculated it. Uh, so let's look at that in this blog post and then uh, go back to that discussion, okay? Okay, let's do it. So uh, in, this, in this blog post, I said that I was surprised uh, that there were so many overseeded courses there, which I hadn't realized. And I was curious about the timing of overseeding. And uh, it seems obvious that if you put the seed too early, that means it's gonna still be summer-like conditions. You're going to create the situation where you have a huge pythium risk on your newly uh, germinating plants. You have a lot of competition for light, for water, and for nutrients from the very actively and rapidly growing warm season turf that exists. So it's just not a good situation in which you want to put uh, new ryegrass. The other problem though is if you wait too late, then it becomes winter and it's cold. And if it's, if it's winter and it's cold and the golf course is still open and you're putting traffic on plants that are not well developed. So you've, you've got, let's say you drop the seed at Thanksgiving. It seems to me that that would be way too cold. The grass just can't develop and there's not enough temperature through the winter. So you can go too early or you could go too late. And as a turf grass manager, it would seem ideal to put the seed down at a perfect time where the warm season grasses are slowing down their growth, but there still remains enough temperature, enough warm temperatures for the ryegrass overseed to establish well. That, that's kind of the idea. And in the blog post, um, which, which I, I show here, uh, I made some charts. Um, and, I, and what I did is I looked at the average air temperature from July through December for each of the past three years. And I looked up data for Augusta National Golf Club, uh, for the location of Ori Georgetown Technical College, uh, and for La Quinta Country Club in Southern California. And if we just look at those temperatures, we don't see clearly, it, it's not obvious from the temperatures uh, when we would exactly want to overseed. Um, but I'm gonna try to identify a point in the autumn when we would want to overseed if we, if we could. Now, we'll talk about some of the business things also, Jim, uh, because it's not always up to the golf course superintendent uh, to seed the grass at exactly the right time, is it? It's not, and I think we need to talk about there's different expectations and different uh, um, methods that are used. And, and, you know, Micah, when you think about overseeding, um, it, what, are you, what is your end goal? What are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to sow a cool season grass surface or sward that is you're playing on cool season grass or are you just trying to put enough rye grass down to say you overseeded give a little color um in the winter and then um honestly though you're playing mostly on the bermuda grass base i mean the, the bermuda grass base here is very important for us um it's not a warm enough climate that uh that we can just forego that and we don't 
we cannot do the type of preparation that the Desert Southwest or, or, or other um, clubs that are preparing for tournaments in the Southeast, we can't do that, right? So we're already trying to establish seed in an environment that is not um, ideal, right? We don't do a ton of preparation anymore either. We, I mean, it varies. I can't speak for everyone, but most just drop the seed. <laughs> They try to open the Bermuda canopy a little bit, but we don't want to damage our Bermuda grass base too much because we need that to get us through the fall and uh, and we need it to come back quickly in the spring. Um, so it's a different mentality. It's a little bit different um, process. And uh, that's kind of what the different dates correlate with. The courses that really want to establish quickly and and maybe play on more of a more of a cool season base um, are going to go earlier, and the ones that really just want to throw some seed down and have a little color and 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 you know we use a term called salt and pepper, right? Have a little salt and pepper look in the winter time, and and then by the time the Bermuda greens up when there's not a lot of seed down there, all of a sudden that third fourth week in February. Um, the rye grass and the Bermuda grass both start to the Bermuda wakes up and the rye starts to have a little bit better growth potential as, as you've shown me over the years. And, and then all of a sudden you have this surface of Bermuda and uh, rye grass together. So um, that's kind of a long winded um, take so on. You're on saying you, you're saying uh, that you don't really, it, when, so I consider overseeding, as the calculations will show, I consider overseeding in October or November in Myrtle Beach to be a little bit late um, and, and not giving enough time for the ryegrass to really establish very well. Now, now you've explained some of the reasons why you may not want the ryegrass to establish too well because it, right. would, it would shorten your Bermuda's season and, and reduce the, the health of the Bermuda, which... Uh, is something that you don't want to do. But are you saying that you don't really um, see nice ryegrass until February, until you get that warm up in the spring? It, so, you, so you get kind of the color and, and salt and pepper look in the coldest time of winter, and then the ryegrass really gets better in February. Yeah, and there's, there's this other turf grass plant called Poa annua that also starts to make an appearance about that time, Micah, which certainly helps green things up and, and fill in as well. So we can't, we can't remember, we can't forget about our old friend, annual bluegrass. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's, uh, let's convert these temperatures. So you, you'll find a direct link to this blog post, uh, in the show notes. Um, I, I've written about this a few times and, and this particular blog post, which I just put up yesterday is, the most uh, detailed look at this, because I've always identified the optimum overseeding date as the time at which the cool season growth potential starts to exceed the warm season growth potential. So you've got the warm season grass growth potential dropping because the temperatures are getting cool, cooler, and you're getting the cool season grass growth potential increasing at the same time because the temperatures are getting cooler. So you're coming out of summer into a time when cool season grass growth is going to have the potential to be better than warm season grass growth. And I've always just picked that single date and then thought, okay, if we, if we average that date oh, year after year after year, and we find some years it's September 20th, some years it's October 10th, some years it's October 15th, some years it's September 25th, then you come up with an average of something like October 3rd. And for that location, we would say October 3rd might be the, the optimum overseeding date. But Larry Stoll from Pace Turf, who, uh, the four, who founded Pace Turf with Wendy Galerter, now I'm the owner and operator of Pace Turf and the Pace Turf Information Service. So I kind of can carry on some of this information sharing and, and do further uh, development of these type of concepts. Larry mentioned, and 
uh, he has mentioned in the past that it's not only that, but you need to make sure that you don't go too late. And of course, he's, he's referring primarily to the desert southwest. Mm-hmm. And, and it gets cold there. And if you oversee, and, and the winter is your main golfing season, your peak golfing season. So if you drop the seed too late, if you wait for the temperatures to get too cool, then you don't get enough establishment. You don't get a healthy stand of turf that's going to be good at Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year and so on. So um, what I did in, in this blog post that you will find a direct link to in the show notes is I didn't just calculate the growth potential. I also looked at the time after that crossover point. Um, So I've brought up on the screen uh, those temperatures, now not showing as a temperature, but those temperatures, those average temperatures from July to January, now as a growth potential curve with a blue line for cool season and a red line for warm season. And if we look at Ori Georgetown Technical College, uh, in 2021, Jim, that crossover point happened in early September. In 2022, that crossover point happened about September 10th. And in 2023, last autumn, it looks like that crossover point also happened at about September 10th. Um, So... Uh, at Augusta National, which is just uh, across the state and across the Augusta River, or no, the Savannah River, isn't it? Um, yep. And in Augusta, that happened in early September, early September, early September. So those are the crossover points. Uh, at La Quinta Country Club in Southern California, those crossover points are happening in early October, um, about October 20th. And in 2023, it happened about October 20th or or later. So um, the the summer lasts a little bit longer in Palm Springs, which is no no surprise. Um, So you're familiar with the growth potential concept. And does that that match at all with what you feel? Like, do you feel that on September 10th or September 15th in Myrtle Beach that you start getting warm season grass growing slower and, and cool season grass would have the potential. Like if you had bent grass greens, that would be a time when your bent grass greens could start to start to do okay again. Absolutely. I do. And, uh, it coincides with, you know, anecdotally when I would probably stop mowing rough or put one of my last mowings on the, on the rough, other than maybe a cleanup mow, um, later in the autumn, I, I do, Micah, you know, uh, here in the Myrtle Beach area, uh, mid-September is the height of hurricane season. And that um, definitely discourages anyone from planning to drop seed at that time. Um, obviously, the later we go in the fall, statistically, the less likely we are to have any tropical entanglements, which uh, can wreak havoc on overseeding, as you can imagine. Yeah, not only do they make a mess, but if they move that seed, uh, that money's gone. And uh, yeah, that's an expensive, it's an expensive problem when when a hurricane destroys the overseed. So that's a risk that one would want to avoid for sure. So I mentioned that uh, in the past, I've kind of looked at this crossover point, identified that as, as the time that would be an optimum to put the seed but what I did yesterday is I made the calculation that um, I made the calculation that looked at the time after that crossover point when the average air temperature remained above 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius because um, that, that's going to give you the optimum growth potential for cool season grass. And if you have that time period from the time the seed is planted until, uh, the temperatures drop too low, that, that, that gives you the, the greatest amount of time for your 
overseed to establish. So if we if we look at that for uh, the Ori Georgetown location in 2021, that that time window was September 2nd to October 18th. In 2022, it was September 13th to September 30th. And in 2023, it was September 14th until October 9th. And you're telling me that what I'm predicting is a little bit earlier than what most of the courses are actually doing. Is, is that right? It is. And, and another factor in that, in addition to the weather, Micah, is POA annua control. That's the optimal window for its germination. And whether you're using a pre-emergent um, at a time frame before, overseeding, whether it's 45 to 60 days, depending on the herbicide, or a post-emergent, um, seven to 10 days before you, obviously the later you go with those um, products, post-emergently especially, especially, the more chance you have to have a little bit better percentage control of POA annua. So that's a huge factor in timing as well. And um, you know, we haven't talked about the business part. We can get to that in a minute, but um, certainly applications of POA control are going to push the window back a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting as we talk through this and you're telling me if this is just for color and it's not, and people are really concerned about having healthy Bermuda grass and they're concerned about POA annua uh, and they're not really trying to play on a ryegrass surface, then I'm like, my uh, paint or pigments <laughs> seem like a way to provide the color, uh, perhaps save some cost, um, provide more options for POA annua control, and probably have healthier Bermuda grass. So, um, where I think I think in the desert southwest uh, at a place like Augusta National that has a pretty major golf tournament in the spring and, and all the member plays on these ryegrass surfaces through the autumn, winter and spring, um, the, the, you know, it's easy to make a case for for really focusing on a nice ryegrass overseed um, in Myrtle Beach. Um, you're you're bringing up a number of things that suggest that it, yeah it is a little bit different there and 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 the ryegrass um it isn't so important um it, in terms of of being a nice thick playing surface yeah you know it's kind of like a, whether you oversee very early in the window or very late um by the time you get to march and april with is going to be the peak season for the spring um, things really start to level off um, where if you and there certainly are courses Micah that can produce a very good ryegrass stand where you're basically playing off ryegrass in the spring don't don't I don't want to misconstrue that that does happen but there's also others that um, rely on that Bermuda base to start popping through as well and uh, and Non-overseeding is an option here. Um, from 2016 to 2022 at Heritage Club, I stopped overseeding and uh, felt like that was a better model for the for that particular club. Uh, but when you talk about painting and everything else, you everything you mentioned is true. Um, it does offer a lot of advantage, but you know, painting also has a cost with it as well, and and uh, it it can be difficult to master. Um, it takes a different management plan. It takes a, um, a year round plan to, to pull that off successfully. And I, I look at it more like a shifting the, um, period when you're not going to be at your best, maybe from, you know, when you're overseeding in the October, November timeframe, when you're establishing and then, the June and July um, time frame when you're transitioning back, when you're overseeding, those are going to be your times when you're not at your best. With, but when you're painting um, or not overseeding, you're going to be at your worst somewhere between February 15 and April 15. So it's just a 
decision that you have to make and what you want to do. Um, obviously, both can. Uh, one thing I've noticed, Micah, if you have a good year for overseeding, you usually have a good year for painting or not overseeding. Those two do seem to um, correlate somehow with the weather. Uh, but uh, explain that to me. You you mean good weather just means better grass and and playing conditions in general. Yes. Um, exactly. And again, I think that goes back to how important the Bermuda base is with our lack of preparation and our establishment without closing. And the six weeks from uh, October 1 to, to, April, to uh, November 15 is peak season in the fall, Micah. And October and November here are the best weather months for golf. There is no doubt they are superior to March and April. Um, so we're very busy. So on top of pushing the window back, right, using pre-emergence and post-emergence to try to control POA annua as best we can, which, as you know, will inhibit some germination of ryegrass, and then having 200 to 250 golfers a day, um, that's a lot of stacked stresses, Micah. It makes it difficult. And uh, one thing I'll say, when I did oversee it, I preferred to go later into November, the first or second week. Um, because October is such an important revenue month. And like I said, the weather is so good. And I wanted the conditions of the course to be ideal then for the golfers. And in November, after daylight savings kicks in, the way the um, daylight hours start to work, you automatically go from having the potential to have 200 golfers a day down to 120, which limits that wear and traffic. So that was always a consideration of mine as well. And... Let's let's talk. Let's transition to talking a little bit about how and when you you accomplish the overseed there. How clubs are doing it without closing, uh, which is an interesting uh, an interesting topic. But I just want to show one more thing from this blog post, and then I'll I'll take this off the screen. Um, some people may be wondering where they can get this type of growth potential information. And uh, I put in here some example charts from the Pace Turf climate appraisal. If you're a Pace Turf subscriber, then at the top of your weather page, you will get these type of charts, uh, not just for the past two years, which is what I show here, uh, but you'll get this for the past five years. So you can look at the growth potential curve for your site, wherever you are in the world. Um, and you, you get a lot of other things uh, like uh, estimated evapotranspiration and various uh, temperatures and disease risks and, and, and so on. But the growth potential one is interesting. There's a couple of growth potential charts there. Um, one just shows the curve through the year of cool season and warm season um, for each year. And there's also one that shows the difference between them, what I call the Delta GP, uh, which can be used as an indication of when you're gonna have some pretty severe heat stress on your cool season turf, among other things. So um, if you're interested in this, you can get a Pace Turf subscription where you can get this uh, and the annual fee is $275. I've talked with some people recently who said, I need to do a better job of marketing this because they recently subscribed and they were uh, impressed and surprised at just how valuable this is. And they're like, Mikey, you need to do a better job of getting the word out. So I know, Jim, you, you've been a, a PaceTurf subscriber for a couple of years, and uh, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, you, you may have looked at those climate appraisals for your site at some time in the past. I have, and fortunate now that um, I have access to two different sites, and I can compare the difference between here in Conway, South Carolina, to my home and former golf course home at Heritage Club in Pauley's Island, which is about a 30-mile difference. Um, Pauley's Island, where I was, is much closer to the ocean, about a mile and a half away from the ocean, where I'm about 10 miles away here. And that really changes the, the climate um, enough that there are little differences. Yes, uh, I, I think the weather has such an impact on how the turf is going to perform that uh, I know golf course superintendents um, are 
you know, they usually have a lot of weather apps on their phone and they're more familiar with the, the recent weather and with the weather current conditions and with the upcoming, you know, the forecast weather to most people. I visited Bob Rayley uh, at Thousand Acres a couple days ago earlier this week and he told me a few times uh, that it had recently rained seven inches um, o over a few days so things were wet and I came back to my mom's house and I was mowing the lawn and I was able to inform her that she's recently experienced seven inches of, of rain <laughs> and, uh, because that's the way turf grass managers have to be uh, so that's cool um, Anyway. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And I will say, Mike, one thing, um, it didn't take me very long when I made the switch from an active turf graph manager to teaching here at the college where I stopped obsessing about the weather, <laughs> which was an interesting change. So it happened pretty quickly, quicker than I thought it would. Well, so you realize you're able to devote some mental energy to things that were, uh, that were previously occupied by uh, weather concerns. Yes, um, I was um, very in tune with the weather as a superintendent, just because I think all turf grass managers to reach their potential or be the best they can be have to be. It's certainly obviously uncontrollable and um, is something that you need to pay attention to very carefully so that you can be as calculated as possible with your decisions on a daily basis. Let's talk about overseeding when the course is open. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, how much how much time does so you can drop seed? Let's just say we're doing tees and fairways only. Yep. Um, does it take three days to get that seed down? And you do the the second nine when when golfers are teeing off on the first nine, and then the next day you tee off on ten and you do the first nine. How? How do you physically get the seed down when the course is open? Well, in a normal market, yeah, that's how you would do it. But um, we have another idiosyncrasy here. You know, every golf course in Myrtle Beach double tees every day, unless they're unless the routing doesn't allow it. We do have a few, um, you know, golf courses that the ninth does not return to the clubhouse, right? But every golf course in Myrtle Beach double. You call tees. that? You call it double tees. I call that a two T start. Yep. Um, maybe that's Japanese terminology. Um, in in Japan, uh, there there are a lot of multi uh, course facilities with 27, 36, 54 holes, uh, and they you know it just gives you more uh, tees that you can tee off at the same time. So it's it's really unheard of. I, that that's similar to the Japanese market where <laughs> you send out as many golfers as you can. Uh, it, yeah, it's it's so that's um, yeah that that method has always been used here. You know, you're gonna have your morning wave and then your afternoon wave. But uh, so uh, it is done nine and nine a lot of times. It's, it's it varies. You know, some clubs do it in the dark um, or very early in the morning. You know, two three a.m. starts or um, some will do it in the afternoon. Uh, Weather conditions are going to impact that as well, and so is the equipment that you're going to use. A lot will use Viacon or Lily-type spreaders on the back of tractors. Uh, there's also a good bit of us, including myself, and that would like to use the seed blower, which is the machine that would blow the seed in. That's a little bit easier to use in, in difficult weather conditions because wind doesn't impact it quite as much. Uh, and uh, But, yeah, it's getting out ahead or behind play and, 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 and slinging the seed and then sometimes coming back and doing tie-ins later. A lot of us will do tees first, Micah, maybe the week before, get those up and going. Um, I would say in general, those are going to be done earlier than fairways, but fairways, it's just going to be a, a, a battle. Um, and you're just going to have to figure out how to do it. And I will say the superintendents around here, both past and present are very adept at, at doing it. And, um, have means and ways that are effective and and um, somewhat uh, maybe obtuse to people when they think about it, but they get it done. And uh, we're used to dealing with a lot of play here. A lot of the golf courses here are going to be in the forty to sixty thousand round range, and um, especially uh, during the peak season, we're going to be very busy. And um, 
we just have to develop techniques to, to work around that. And you said that October and November are the best weather for golf. Mm -hmm. And and what's the and you're basically seeding a lot of places would be seeding in late October and in November. Yeah, I'm gonna so say, see yeah, the the prime time is is and it depends on the it it depends on the golf course and what group they're with, right? We have several large groups. We have one group that has twenty one golf courses, right? And so they stagger theirs out um, over a six maybe a four week period. Right. And then there's other groups that maybe have five or six courses or two or four and, um, some share equipment that comes into it. Um, I mentioned that seed blower, um, there's several golf courses that will use that. Uh, so you kind of have to have a, um, a, an order of who's going when and, but you know, you know October 15th, I'm going to say is traditionally Micah, that is the prime week. If, if all things considered, optimal uh october 15th october 15th but i've seen seed dropped thanksgiving and 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 seed dropped on 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 december first week of december that when you look at it in march or april it it the surface is just as good <laughs> really um because it's because of the bermuda and, and you know the ryegrass um certainly when we get to the warm temperatures like we're having now um Ryegrass is adept at growing quite quickly when uh, when things become favorable. And and I'm I'm a little bit confused about how you're dropping seed. If that if it's October fifteenth, that's like the right at the beginning of the peak golfing season. So I guess people are not just running the sprinkler heads all the time to encourage the grass to germinate because you would struggle to have a busy golf course with a 2T start and sprinklers running on the fairways constantly. And I remember, um, I, I've been involved with a few overseeds. There's usually some water added to keep that seed wet or to keep the young plants from desiccating. How, how, how do you accomplish that in the peak season? You just do it. It's definitely, in my opinion, probably the biggest disadvantage of doing it that um your playability of the golf course will go down um you know cart restrictions is a big thing too we have a wide variety of cart restrictions some clubs do not restrict carts at all Mike. okay they just they drop the seed um they will restrict carts for immediately after the seed is dropped until they feel like it's um far enough into the canopy where it will not track into the rough, but then they, they ride on it right after that. You know, some will ride on it until it germinates and then maybe take a little time off after it germinates to help it establish. Others won't. Others will go car path only for two to three weeks because of, to help the seed come up, but just because they're watering it so much um, that maybe it becomes too wet for cart traffic. And we have a an interesting mixture of soils in Myrtle Beach. We have a lot of sandy soils, but then we also have areas that have a heavier clay gumbo soil that uh, um, is obviously your soil type is going to impact not only how wet the golf course is and, and how the grass germinates or how it doesn't germinate well if it's very sandy and dry. So it's there's a lot of factors that, that go into uh, the planning and and the establishment phase. So, and there's not, you know, we haven't really talked much about the preparation on the front end. Um, there's really not a lot of, of, of preparation. There used to be more, there used to be more verticutting and kind of um, opening up that Bermuda grass base to uh, let, get good seed to soil contact. But again, we're relying on that base of Bermuda to, to be a playing surface throughout the fall, the winter, and even into the the early spring and then obviously transitioning out we need it to come on as quickly as possible because summer is becoming more and more of a um, secondary peak season for the clubs here um, local play is much much more of a um, revenue driving uh, sector of our play which wasn't the case 20 years ago so you have to be cognizant of that as well and uh, 
Um, but the good thing is we have a lot of courses here. We have a lot of variety. There's a lot of people that do things differently. So it kind of helps the end user golfer know that um, they can find good conditions here in Myrtle Beach year round if they just do their homework, Micah. Yeah, with, with that many courses and with the staggering of the of the work like that, uh, you you can find what you're looking for um, if if you know where to look. Ask Absolutely. asking somebody like you, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm always here to help. <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it's <clears throat> it, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting for me to make that calculation and then find out that you're actually seeding a bit later when the temperatures are cooler. But then, as you mentioned at the start, uh, we need to consider what the purpose of the overseeding is. And if it's, if it's not to have a really nice ryegrass stand by Thanksgiving, which, which that would be the case in the, in the desert Southwest, a lot of people would come down and play golf or, or move to their winter homes in, by Thanksgiving and be there in December. Um, so, so you want to have a really nice ryegrass surface where in your case, you just want some plants there to give some color, give a little bit of traffic resistance or traffic tolerance, enhancement to the Bermuda grass, maybe support the ball a little bit better than a beaten down traffic dormant, completely dormant Bermuda grass. And then to, to be nice and really pretty in the spring when it warms up again. So that's a little bit uh, different focus. So then you can get away with seeding with what I would consider to be a little bit late, but you have described to me that, that it is a bit of a salt and pepper look in the winter potentially. And, and, it, and you don't really get that solid ryegrass until February and March when it starts to warm up again, which is exactly why I'm making the prediction to say <laughs> September 16th might be a better time. But then you, it's still hot, so you do run into the pythium risk and, and uh, the higher irrigation requirements. So you know, overseeding is, is never an easy thing, but man, when it gets pulled off right and when you have those beautiful days uh, when, when it's looking so good, um, it, it is something that, that, that I have fond memories of and I, and I quite like seeing it and I enjoyed seeing it when I, uh, when I visited a couple weeks ago. It's, it's a great surface, Micah. Don't, don't get me wrong. When it's done properly, the mixture of ryegrass and Bermuda grass in the spring in the southeast um, creates a very, very good fairway surface. It, it just does, and um, there's no doubt about that. That's why, to use some of an analogy similar to one that you would use, that's why the golf courses that are holding big tournaments in the spring in the southeast, like Augusta National, Quail Hollow, Harbor Town, the Dunes Club here in Myrtle Beach, why they're overseeding wall to wall because it it will be the um, it will look the best and probably play the best for what they want, um, which is to challenge the best golfers in the world and to cater to a group of golfers that have very high expectations, Micah, for perfection. <laughs> which the rest of us really can't um, expect on a daily, daily basis unless we're um, members at somewhere that um, has the resources to produce those kind of conditions. So, but uh, sometimes, Micah, to me, um, the longer I've done this, the more <laughs> fascinated I am with the other um, spectrum or the other side of the business with very, very low inputs and um, what kind of surfaces and that that produces and um that's fascinating to me and you and i've had a few conversations about that as well we have jim and uh i have a, a blog post about that um that let's run through real quickly if you've got a couple more minutes oh, shall I have we all the time for the listeners of the double cut and you i'm i'm locked in my friend all right i uh on this same trip i played a golf course also in South Carolina uh, and, and I saw some interesting grass. The title of this post, which I'll also put a, a link to uh, in, in the show notes, the title of this is, is, this is the kind of green where zoysia beats Bermuda grass. And I mentioned that I've not really been an advocate for zoysia grass greens 
Um, and, and I haven't been an advocate for them where Bermuda grass greens are a viable option. You know, the reason for this is ball roll. I link to a blog post and to a video that show why that is because with Bermuda grass greens, you tend to get a smoother and faster ball roll with the same amount of maintenance. So I was surprised immediately after Myrtle Beach, I went uh, to another town in South Carolina and I played golf at a, uh, at a local country club, but it, it was a public facility. And I, I'm showing on the screen now an image of the eighth green at that facility. And there's a Bermuda grass green with some POA. Um, this was in April. I think the amount of POA that was in those greens is not really represented well by the photo. Uh, Jim, the photo that you sent me after, after I shared this experience with you, um, where there was a, you took a photo that showed batter POA on greens at another facility that you visited. I didn't bring my camera with me on this. I, I borrowed my, uh, my playing partner's phone to take these pictures. And I wasn't really focused on taking POA pictures. I was focused on highlighting the zoysia that I found growing on the green. Uh, so there was a lot of POA on the green. So uh, the Bermuda grass was not terrific, um, but it, it made a nice fast putting surface. And the first six greens, there was no zoysia. And on the seventh green, I noticed, wow, there's a patch of zoysia on this green. And when we got, but I didn't take a picture. I came to the eighth green, I saw another patch of zoysia on the green. The zoysia was doing so much better than the Bermuda grass that I, I, I borrowed the camera and I said, I need to take a picture of this. This could be a blog post. So um, have, you, have you ever seen this where there's zoysia growing apparently wild or um, that probably was sodded in just in a patch on a Bermuda grass green? I've done it, Micah. You've done it. I've done wow. it. Wow. At Heritage Club, I did it. Um, number four is a green that I think I pointed out to you when we were driving around in the in the van at Heritage um, that had a lot of oak trees around it right before we went down. Uh, I think uh, I showed it to you. But anyway, it was surrounded by live oak trees, and there was an area in the back that would always struggle. And one year I just decided to slap down some diamond zoysia back there. Um, and it worked quite well for many, many years. And, uh, you know, I have, we have another facility here in Myrtle beach called Tupelo Bay golf center. It's a driving range. They have a, an 18 hole executive course and non hole, a nine hole par three where they have disc golf, par three, uh, foot golf, mini golf. Um, but they have an 18 hole executive course. And, uh, one of, uh, our students works there and I get to visit him and, the last three greens on that course are diamond zoysia as well, Micah. And they are by far the best three greens on the golf course because of shade and, and other reasons. The Tiff Dwarf Bermuda that was planted originally back in 2000 or 2001 really struggles. But the, uh, the diamond is not, uh, it's not perfect, but overall it's a better putting surface in, 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 that, uh, in that situation. And yeah, I mean, I think it's just like, I'm trying to think of how to phrase it because I, I definitely think that Bermuda grass is a better putting surface, but some places just aren't able to maintain a good Bermuda grass green. Now, whether that's because of soil conditions, because of shade conditions, because of the way that the grass is managed or not having enough resources to be able to produce a good Bermuda grass surface, um, those, those kind of courses sometimes can have a much better putting surface if they have zoysia. But um, for the highest level greens, I think you, you tend to get better surfaces with Bermuda grass rather than zoysia. So you can have really nice zoysia uh, as a, as a, for ball roll, for, for uh, playability. But to make the zoysia grass match Bermuda grass, you have to do extra work. So um, I, I think it, it, to really understand this, you need to play on a lot of Bermuda grass and zoysia grass. And, and then I think you'll get the idea of what I'm talking about, because um, I think I've probably played on zoysia grass greens more than most people. And I'm somewhat familiar with the way the ball rolls and, and I've measured the, the 
green speed on a lot of zoysia greens. I've measured the bobble test, which is smoothness and trueness on a lot of zoysia greens. With the new USGA GS3 ball, as they develop that data set, I'm, I'm confident that uh, <laughs> the data, if that was separated by grass type, you would find that a Bermuda grass green tends to be smoother and truer for ball roll than zoysia. And so you've, you've uh, managed zoysia grass on greens, you've played and observed zoysia grass on greens. Um, am, I, am I missing something here or am I, am, I, am, I, am I too much of a fan of Bermuda grass greens for playability or, or is there really that difference? Have you noticed that same difference, Jim? I mean, obviously, like, like you said, Mike, and you, you are the, you know, one of the experts on zoysia grass greens. Let's not, you are. And, uh, yeah, but, you know, and I only managed a section of a green with it. Now, I did have, I do have some other experience with diamond zoysia grass from my time at Caledonia Golf and Fish Club when I was assistant superintendent there. We had a practice area where, I, where we established three diamond zoysia greens uh, from Spriggs which was an interesting experience to grow those in. Um, and I did manage those. And um, yeah, it's you're never going to get the same kind of speed and smoothness. But from what I saw at that Tupelo Bay, it was easier to produce a, a surface, a, a smoother surface there with zoysia than it was with, with Bermuda. And one thing that stands out to me when I visit places like that and other places that are lower end budget-wise, it's just there's a lot of people out there and they're enjoying themselves and, and, and they're happy. And, and, you know, they're obviously not obsessed with the, with the conditions. They're just enjoying the, uh, the weather and, and being outside and, and recreating. And it kind of reminds me a lot of, of what the game was like maybe a hundred years ago, Micah, you know? Yeah. That, um, so that's exactly right. Yeah. For, for people to be out there having fun, and on that course that I played, if all those greens were zoysia and, and the condition was like those zoysia patches on the greens, it would be, a, a, people would be raving about the greens. Um, and, and yet the speed on that and the stuff that sometimes I'm concerned about at the very high end of golf, uh, the tournament type of conditions, maybe that's not what real golf is. Um, so... I'm thinking if you're Bay Hill, for example, uh, you probably don't want zoysia grass greens. You probably want ultra dwarf greens. Um, if you're Pinehurst and you're going to be hosting the U.S. Open on a particular course, you probably are, are going to have more options with producing tournament level conditions if you have ultra dwarf Bermuda grass. So, when I get that stuck in my mind, I'm just, zoysia doesn't reach that standard. Uh, for zoysia to reach that standard, it's so much work, why would you bother with it? But then you go to these places that get much less maintenance and fewer inputs, and you can see, wow, that zoysia was better than the Bermuda. There's no, there's no doubt about it. Um, yep. and, and I think that's, that's something that I've seen in Asia also. Um, and so, yeah, there, there can be a place for zoysia, but... Yeah, it's, I just, I don't like deliberately choosing a grass that's not going to produce as good of a putting surface. But with that said, it, it can produce a pretty good putting surface. If you struggle to, if you struggle to produce good ultra dwarf, then, then zoysia is a nice option. Yes, it is. And, you know, shade plays a big factor in that, I think, as well. And, uh. It's interesting, you know, I, we have some of these newer varieties of zoysias coming out, as you know, in, in, the, in the States, and I don't know where they're at with those worldwide, Micah, but um, that are, you know, promising improved putting conditions. But I think inherently zoysia grass will always be kind of with seashore past palum that it's at the high end, it's going to take more effort to produce um, an acceptable, acceptable surface. So... But, uh, you know, one thing I noticed about lower budget courses, too, is just when you don't fertilize very much, Micah, and I'm interested to see your thoughts on this, just um, how it does seem to tip the advantage to the turf grass over weeds when fertility is really withheld. And it reminds me of 
a lot of the things that uh, Dr. McKenzie used to say in his books back in the day about uh, fertilization and, and, and grasses. And I've been able to see that a few times this winter, and it's fascinating to me um, how uh, when you just let things be, um, turf grass can have an advantage over weeds. Or if the weeds are not fertilized, they don't grow very much, and it really is a nice turf, which has always been... Yeah explained to me when I first went to school here is nothing more than an area of mowed vegetation. It doesn't have to all be grass. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I realized and I mentioned in the, in the grammar of greenkeeping about just, it's, it's managing the growth rate. What we're really trying to do is manage the growth rate to produce the type of surface that we want. Um, and it's not necessarily to put fertilizer to make the health, healthiest grass possible. And, and when you do that, there's, there's a lot of options um, to, to produce a, a nice surface. Absolutely. All right, Jim. Well, we've reached an hour, and I think we both have some other things to do. So um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I'm so glad that we could get through both of those topics. Uh, I'm so interested in overseeding, timing, weather, zoysia, Bermuda grass. Um, golf hops, hot spots, two T starts. Uh, so thank you for sharing all of your insight and, and knowledge. Well, thank you for having me, Micah. Um, thank you for coming to Ori Georgetown and, um, and speaking. Your seminar generated a ton of conversation amongst the students and the superintendents and professionals that were there, which to me ultimately is why you have events like that. And, um, you know, I was able to go through your slides in class um, after the thing and really brought up a lot of great discussions. And it, you know, it was just very impactful. So, so thank you for coming. And it was a, it was a, a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. And I hope I've just got, I forgot to plug in my battery. Oops. That is, that was going to end the show for us. <laughs> anyway. All right, Jim. Well, thank you for those kind words. Uh, thanks everyone for listening. Um, we got that battery back now and I'll sign off now for ATC from Oakland County, Maryland. I'm Michael Woods. Bye-bye.